Okay, welcome to this international and interactive session on professional standards and ethics. Um, I'm going to hand over first of all, I'm going to introduce um, Pete Hinton, who is somewhere behind me, who's going to introduce the idea, the concept for the sessions. Um, but I just want to thank our sponsors, who are RPA and Historic England, uh, for supporting the session today, and I'll be back with you after Pete's told us what we're doing. <laughs> now Terry's going to tell us what we're doing. Uh, the reason for <laughs> the reason for having the session is, as you know, the, the Chart Institute for Archaeologists is a professional institute, a professional association um, in archaeology, and in our travels around the world, um, representatives of CIFA have met like-minded people. Uh, there are other professional institutes in the, in the world or other professional <laughs> registers in the world. There are other organizations that might possibly become professional associations. And there are countries in the world that don't have an organization yet to fulfill that role, but might dream of making one or joining one. So <clears throat> we, we, we're going to talk about problems. There are a number of problems. There's lots of work for professional associations to do. We suspect that we have a lot of common problems and there might be common solutions and today is just an opportunity to explore together what the problems are and what the solutions might be. And so I'm going to hand the talking stick or the talking sock to Terry now, um, who will explain that we're not going to... We're not here to enjoy ourselves, we're here no. to work. So this, this is going to be kind of a different type of session. This is going to be a working session. Uh, where we're going to be the talking heads for about an hour, 20 minutes, and then we're going to go and have a very highly interactive. So what's going to happen is that each of the gentlemen up here, <laughs> I had to pause there. Um, <laughs> uh, each of us will, will say what our affiliation organization does very, very briefly in terms of what we do to promote uh, professionalism and ethical behavior within our profession. And then we're going to do our three problem issues very quickly. And then Chris is going to be recording them on the flip chart here as we go. And we're just going to keep recording them and go through all that. Then we'll take a break. When we come back together, what we're going to do is we're going to discuss the problems. We'll try to see where the commonalities are and we'll kind of lump them all together and we'll have some discussions if there's a clarification like you, I say something you don't know well, what, the, what the hell does that mean in America and we'll kind of talk about it but the goal is to find out the commonalities get down to the top three or four or five together and so we'll identify what those are and then Chris will take over and we're going to work together to identify the solutions that you as individuals within your respective organizations can so begin to solve these problems and address these key problems. And also as partnerships with all of us involved at a global level with promoting professional and archaeology, how can we do that together? So this is going to be kind of a different type of situation. Are we good? All right. So I'll go ahead and start. Uh, uh, my name is Terry Klein. I'm the, the uh, president of the Register of Professional Archaeologists. And you've heard my talk already that the uh, register uh, is basically a listing of individuals who commit to a standard uh, code of conduct and standards of research performance. And we promote professionalism through um, registration. We don't have members. We have registrants. Uh, we also promote it through a grievance process if one of our, our registrants breaks the code of conduct or standards of research. If someone is falsely accused, we then back them up and demonstrate that they have not violated. And we also certify field schools and uh, continuing uh, professional development courses. So that's what we do. So the register's top three problems. Okay, so I'm going to read these. Uh, increasing the demand for registered professional archaeologists, especially among consumers of archaeological work, such as federal or state agencies and private industry. We need to demonstrate the value of hiring a registered professional. In addition, some believe that the register is anti-competitive. Okay, so we'll let Chris write. Okay, the second is, in the U.S., there are no clear, well-defined paths to professionalism in archaeology. Students and young 
archaeologists need to have easy access to information and resources on how to become a professional archaeologist. So no path to professionalism. And the third item is that we want to make sure our code of conduct and standards of research performance are keeping up with the current and changing nature of our discipline in the U.S. Do we need to change and update our registration criteria, which is now currently based solely on having an MA and demonstrated substantive research in archaeology? Do we need different tracks for registration, given the changes in the archaeological practice? Are we good, Chris? Good. Okay. Now we go to Italy. Whoa. <laughs> Here we are. So I'm Alessandro Pintucci. I'm the president of Confederazione Italiana Archaeology. That is the first uh, professional association of archaeologists and students of archaeology in Italy. We were born in uh, 2004. And um, we are uh, uh, growing this, in this moment because we have two uh, recent laws that recognize this, uh, on a part the uh, professional association in Italy that is uh, um, was in the law of uh, 2013 and then a law in the 2014 uh, that recognizes um, the professional as, um, uh, professions uh, the professions of uh, cultural heritage um, starting with a, a public not binding list of all professionals uh, working in Italy. So we are, we're working on this and so we have not uh, a register, we're not, we didn't register uh, the, our members uh, to, to recognize uh, them to, to the public, but we have a public, we will have a public list of all professionals where the, associ the professional association uh, will have the role of uh, um, attesting the quality of, of the um, professionals uh, listed in it. So I will try to address the three main problems of uh, Italian archaeology. I'm, okay, first of all, we're suffering the lack of general professional standards. In 2014, low uh, 110 uh, recognized cultural heritage professions, establishing the creation of not binding public lists of professionals to which it's possible to be included meeting professional standards and skills set up by the state with the collaboration of professional association and other private and public stakeholders. So we, we basically we wrote the law in a way. Uh, while it was initially considered a six month deadline for the guidelines of the standards, we're still waiting for them. So the, not six months, but three and three years. Bureaucracy. Uh, we read a draft of the document that now must be accepted by the legal service of Ministry of Culture because it's the Ministry of Culture that will uh, utilize, uh, utilize, use uh, the, um, the public list. And we probably will have them ready for the end of the year, probably. Okay, second, one of the reasons for the choice to, to write a public set of professional standards is that in, the, in Italy, the state, through its territorial officers working in the superintendence, is the owner of all the archaeological archeologi remains and findings, and above all, the scientific director of the excavation, even of those privately financed. So we have always a scientific director that it is, uh, it is not the archaeologist working on the site. So Italian professional archaeologists have two clients, one commercial client, public or private, that is the one uh, who uses his own uh, money for the excavation required by the law following in polluters pay rule, and who needs to, has to be quick in our work, and a scientific client, that is the state officer of the local superintendents. One of the major problems is the lack of autonomy and the, uh, of the professional in choosing the right excavation strategy, for example, that always needs to be accepted by the officer often having a, a different view about it, obviously. Moreover, it is often very difficult to uh, explain to our commercial client that there are many differences between us and the state superintendents, so that we are not the same thing, and we cannot choose by ourselves what to dig and when. Another issue about this system is the total impossibility to choose independently if um, uh, and when to disseminate the results of the research or excavation. As the officer or scientific director of the research, it is him or her that has to decide to publish the results and even if get the professional involved in a publication. The latter problem will be discussed by our association in a conference in May about intellectual property. Last but not least, low wages issue, but it's a common problem, I think. <laughs> the lack of a proper professional recognition, lack of standards, and the lack of professional autonomy, state scientific direction, are part of the reasons for which Italian archaeologists are badly paid. 
even lower than elsewhere if compared with national mean wages. In addition to this, the most of Italian archaeologists are self-employed. So we have a system that is basically, basically uh, of self-employing archaeologists, not very big companies. And even when they work for a company, they have a, not an, an employed contract and are paid for the days they really work. So if I work today, I will pay. If tomorrow I don't go to the excavation, I will not have my, my uh, there is not a monthly wage, okay? Not always. These have obviously bad consequences. First, the professional abandon of is particularly high, often in direction of tourism uh, based profession like guides and so on. Second, the low wages don't motivate the professional growth of in terms of skills or professionalizing courses. Why to spend money in a course when my wage will be always be uh, low? Third, being paid for the real days of work and being badly paid indeed, it means that if I cannot earn well in a single day, I will try to earn more by staying on the excavation or the longer possible, slowing down the work, obviously. Fourth, and this is the last, the low wages and the lack of specific laws about the dissemination results, it is one of the reasons for which only a few excavations are published, leaving the most of them in the grey literature. Thank you. Japan. Japan. <laughs> Hello. Uh, first of all, thank you for giving me the opportunity to make a presentation here. I'm very excited to see what will happen from now. I'm from Osaka, Katsuo Kamura, and work for work Osaka City Culture Property Association. OCCPA is the same public body, a non-profit organization founded in 1979 by Osaka City after the integration of the then ad hoc three research units. Currently, OCCPA is a part of Osaka City Museum organization with five museums. The number of staff is 20, including those working for the Historical Museum and the Conservation Lab. We used to have more than 30 people until the late 90s, where the recession started. And um, our role is primarily conduct archaeological research prior to urban development in Osaka City and to conserve as much as remains as possible. Our mission is to hand down Osaka heritage to future generations. Over the past 40 years, as, a, as the only archaeological research body for Osaka City, we have done more than 2,000 excavations at over 200 sites covering 20% of Osaka City. I'm sorry that we will not be able to tell you how we define, promote archaeological standards, ethics, and professionalism as well as you do. I understand that they are very important, but it seems to me that we Japanese archaeologists, particularly ones working for local government and the same public bodies, covering 80% of all archaeologists, I also uh, uh, pre-circulate the paper. So uh, this is a comparison of the British archaeologists and uh, Japanese archaeologists. So 80%. Uh, here, Jap British archaeologists, 60% are commercial. And Japanese archaeologists, local authority, 54, and the same public, 27. So in total, 81%. And the companies are just 8%. Okay? The structure is quite different. Of course, we have archaeological standards and uh, set by the Ministry of Culture, but it's not so high for the professional body like us, since the standard is orig originally oriented to local heritage manager by our definition, experts for buried cultural properties. They are often required to be a professional in heritage management in general, not confined to archaeological professional. The need for qualification system has been, uh, has been often discussed, particularly since the 60s and 90s, due to the influence of privatization in archaeology. It has not yet become common, but will be in near future. I think we might be on the way from unconsciousness, self-regulation system to the open uh, assessment system. But personally, I believe the archaeological standards and the ethics primarily uh, depends on good excavation and it's good publication open to the other experts as well as public. And good excavation needs the support of scientists and the particular geologists. Fortunately, we have two geologists uh, who have created stratigraphical standards at major sites in the city. The results are linked to the GIS at good publication. They often keep the critical eye on our excavation, promoting and keeping higher standards. As for E6 in Japan, excavation prior to the development is done as administration work. 
This means we have to publish the report after excavation as soon as possible. And I'm happy to say that we only have a very small backlog. I think that archaeologists in Japan will focus on good publication rather than on ethical behavior in excavation if asked about ethics in archaeology. In short, I believe how much openness is secured is the key when we consider the promotion of archaeological standards, ethics, and register compliance. So second one, uh, so three greatest problems we face in promoting professionalism and ethical behavior. First, uh, securing stable management of the archaeological organization under the whimsical uh, local history, uh, no, economy. A long recession, the slow growth in Japan after the late 90s has considerably lowered the budget for salvage archaeology, and uh, it has become more difficult for us to keep and uh, develop archaeological standards, particularly for elaborate works like uh, soil sampling uh, in collaboration with other scientists uh, handling ecofacts. Under the severe economic uh, situation, managing the organization itself tends to be the the ultimate goal for us, rather than promoting professionalism and ethical behavior. As a result, the excavation is oriented to just a regular removal of soils. Uh, secondly, the growth of expansion of business principle in archaeology. Uh, following the development of uh, privatization in archaeology, probably uh, uniquely in the world, contract company, which you uh, used to support us by providing machines, workers, and others have become major excavation companies. In 2005, they established their own business association in which about 70 units uh, participate and wage lobbying campaign for privatization of uh, salvage excavation. It should be noted that major construction companies such as Obayashi, Kajima, and uh, Shimizu uh, I, probably you're familiar with that name, corporation name, are uh, supporting members of the association. Naturally, the developers tend to be far less interested in the quality of excavation than effective management. It is feared that the partnership between the developers and the private archaeological units might lead to the deterioration of the quality of excavation, publication of its result, and the succession of archaeological heritage to local community. Third, the lack of wealth uh, trained successor and or insufficient succession of archaeological expertise and skill to future generation. Over the last five or ten years or so, some Japanese archaeologists, including me, recognize that the younger generation seem unable to manage excavation well and have been worried about the future of Japanese archaeology and heritage management. Japanese, uh, the reason is apparent. They do not get uh, enough experience in the field work, including excavation, while they are student. When they were a student more than 30 years, uh, when I was a student more than 30 years ago, probably I look young, but uh, <laughs> student majoring archaeology often skipped class and joined survey excavations. Then we learned a lot of practical knowledge about archaeology, how to conduct excavation from severe senior archaeologists. Sometimes we learn how to drink from them. <laughs> but the time has so changed. University students cannot skip class like secondary school children. And what was worse, teachers are obliged to teach classes as a syllabus in the curriculum while doing other administrative job for effective management of his uh, or her university. Teacher cannot afford to teach a practical side of archaeology, and it is often, uh, it is also often the case that teacher cannot teach how to organize the excavation due to their own lack of experience. To make things worse, despite multiple job posts, due to the retirement of a senior heritage manager, the insufficient number of the application to fill the vacancies is becoming a serious problem across the heritage sector. All in all, the current situation works negatively for the successor in both sides of university archaeology and heritage management, uh, and a new collaboration was recently started to combat this problem. Thank you. <laughs> uh, 
Uh, right. I'm, I'm reporting on behalf of, of other individuals. Um, so first off, I'm going to be here in, in loco uh, PANAF, Pan-African Archaeological Association. And um, this is an outcome of, of work that I've been doing. So I'm in part just reading a script for you. So PANAF is the African side of, of archaeologists working in Africa. There is another organization called SAFA, Society for Africanist Archaeology, which is primarily made up of North Americanists or European who also work in Africa. But, and the two organizations tend to coincide their conferences uh, every other time. But neither of them is, in our terms, a professional association. PANAF, which is currently headquartered in Dakar, um, was created 60 years ago. It is a membership organization, and it was created to do the following mission. Uh, first, to facilitate a gathering of Africanist archaeologists working across the continent, to provide a forum for the exchange of information and ideas, to create contacts between scholars, students, and practitioners of African archaeology, and four, to establish links and fruitful collaboration among practitioners of African archaeology, both within the continent and beyond. And through their, their conferences, they do achieve most of those goals most of the time. But you'll notice that what's missing from that are the topics which the, the previous four speakers have, sorry, previous three, have mentioned that are characteristics of being professionals. There wasn't a single mention, for example, of ethics in the mission, the mission statement of PANAF. PANAF tends to work and tends to represent Africa south of the Mediterranean littoral. So it's the Sahel and areas south. And some of the country, that, that's a, obviously a vast area. And the situation is not the same throughout. So I'm going to offer a few comments and then I'll go straight to their top three problems. There are small but active professional type associations in a number of the countries. Um, for example, uh, South Africa and Zimbabwe and Western Cape have all got uh, small but active professional associations, which are to some extent uh, divisive and controversial, even in their own, in, even in their home countries. Um, most of the rest of the continent has a primarily state-focused and state-run system of doing heritage management including archaeology. There are small but active commercial sectors that undertake parts of the archaeological work in countries such as South Africa, Cameroon, Chad, Senegal, Mauritania, Nigeria, uh, and some of the other Maghreb countries. Um, the MENA countries, the Mediterranean littoral, often have a more, um, well, they can be equally divided, frankly. So. It is a very large area, it is very diverse, and you won't be surprised to understand that the overwhelming problem is one of poverty. Poverty in a number of different ways, not just economic. So if I go straight to the, the three issues that um, the, the president of PANAF uh, supplied me with, the first and most important one to him was a poor education of the professionals and also of the general public about what archaeology is and what role archaeology should have in social life in those countries. Um, he mentioned particularly the need to develop curricula in archaeology, produce modern textbooks, um, and use that to work through to the museum world as well. Problem two, uh, a weakness, a severe weakness, of archaeological and heritage legislation in the majority of the African countries. Um, in some ways, that misstates, I think, the problem that the legislation is not always weak or it's almost always present, and it is sometimes quite well written. It is not always equally well implemented. And that is a, f a feature of the poverty of the country in general and the weakness of the archaeological heritage sector in particular. Uh, problem three, the existing legislation uh, is poorly implemented, which causes as a result, immense damage 
in the form of destruction through development, unconstrained development, also increasingly a problem of looting and pillaging and the consequences of conflict, particularly in the area of the Sahel. So they think, or Panaf suggests to me, that they feel a very, very great need for increasing professionalism, but it needs to start at a very basic level, starting from legislation and strengthening government ministries and work from that, what do I say upwards, but working from that outwards, perhaps, across the rest of the heritage sector. Shall I pass on and come back to you? Or I can move to the next country. Okay, right. Bear with me. Uh, two two people are not are not present with us. They are um, the the two directors, or the director and the secretary, president and secretary, of DIGUF, which is a German learned society. <coughs> so sorry, I should also say I know there are people in the audience. Um, there's at least one here who has as good a knowledge of PANAF as I do. So Nathan, if I've led astray, you can correct us later. And secondly, while I'm talking about what's going on in Germany, Ray, you can correct me. Later. Do it later. Thank you, Nathan. Do it later. <laughs> Let me finish. <laughs> okay. DGUF is a is a learned society in Germany. It stands for uh, German Society for Pre and Proto History. They have about seven hundred active members. They have annual conferences, which are exceedingly well attended. They are an extraordinarily active society, but they are only one of a number, and they're is in the terms that we are talking about here, no German professional association. There are a number of associations, quite a number of associations who will claim to be professional in one way or another, and will claim in one way or another to represent all of German archeology, span but in fact, they, they don't do that. In fact, they don't do that. I don't wanna to be too controversial, but to mention some, there, there for example, are three antiquary societies, one for north, south, and east, which are not unlike the Society of Antiquaries of London, in, in to draw amongst the, the British here, to draw a kind of a parallel. There are a number of period-based societies which represent archaeologists who do, for example, medieval archaeology or prehistoric archaeology. Um, there is an association for the chief archaeologists for each of the 16 German states, it being a federal um, country. Each of the states has a state service, and the state archaeologist would tend to say that he or she, primarily he, represents and speaks for all of his or her employees, and therefore they represent all of archaeology in Germany whether or not those linkages are as real in practice as they might like to say is perhaps open to debate. So there are a number of organizations which have a variety of overlapping and sometimes conflicting interests and actions, and the organizations which tend to cut across that accepted structure are the ones like DGUF, DGUF. Now, DGUF have been working over, I guess, the last two years, representing a growing interest amongst German archaeologists, especially field archaeologists, not just digging, but, but everybody doing heritage management in one way or another, and representing a growing interest in a professional association which is not period-based and is not limited to any one of the 16 German states or is not limited to employees of the state. And they gave me the following three um, problems, if you will, the three issues which are, are focusing their attention at the moment. So um, looking across at Chris. First, there is no clear idea in Germany or in the German archaeological sector of what a professional organization is or even what an archaeologist is. Because formally, legally, uh, structurally, a professional archaeologist is someone who has a degree. No other expertise or experience is required, simply the university degree. So two, commercial archaeologists in particular feel the need for a widely accepted set of professional rules or standards, but there is no clear idea or a consensus about how to either create them or to implement them. And three, there is no clear understanding about how to deal with individuals 
who are suspected of breaking the rules. Three problems I think most of us in this room would be familiar with. So I'll, I'll stop there. And again, if I've gone astray or if you want more detail, then particularly Ray in the audience here can tell us much more about, Jerry, about the German situation. Uh, restate number two, please. Number two, number two. Uh, commercial archaeologists in particular feel the need for widely accepted rules, standards, and codes of ethics. Each of those organizations tends to have its own code, but has no means of, of uh, determining who joins the association or means of judging whether or not their code has been, has been broken in any way. Good, Chris? Yes, thanks. Okay. Thanks very much. Uh, my name is Mark Spanier, and who am I representing here? I do believe I'm representing myself. Um, yeah. <laughs> but, uh, um, <laughs> um, well, that's never happened before. Never happened before, yeah. No, no. The, <laughs> the, the, let's say a, sort of a short discussion of, of professional archaeology in the Netherlands for the last Let's, let's put it on 17 years. 17 years ago, the, the first time I met Pete Hinton here was on the opening conference of the Dutch Society for Archaeologists, which was intended to be a professional body for archaeologists. There were 450 plus members there. It was a very lively thing and there was a, a mood in the room of we'll achieve great things together. Uh, at this stage, NVVA, the Nederlandse Vereniging voor Archaeologie, has, a, well, I, don't quote me on it, but let's say close to 100 people, then I'm a bit op optimistic. And their activities are, well, their annual meeting where the board tells them how little they could do because there's no support, etc., etc. So in short, the, the dream and the optimism of, let's say, 20 years ago has, has gone. Uh, this doesn't mean that, that the Netherlands are not a, are a sort of a ruleless, unprofessional desert. It's absolutely not true, but our possibilities to sort of make our own set of rules and be self-regulated, and we have sort of collectively thrown them away. Thrown them away, yeah, thrown away. Sometimes I get the idea that English is slipping. Um, I, um, we were given quite a lot of money by the Dutch state to have our own register. To, and we put in quite a lot of time. And probably the, one of the reasons I'm here that I spent well, many an evening on what a Dutch quality system should be. And in the end, uh, when we had it, we had 80 people registered in the senior grade. So which at that stage uh, we were on track. The minister even told uh, parliament that we had a register. And then there was this, this almost, I cannot explain this in seven minutes, This wondrous collapse of the system and there was a sort of a collective sigh of relief we will not be registered hooray but then of course we tend to forget that ministries have drawers where they have old reports in it and a report of 18 years before serviced and we were suddenly confronted by a state which said you will be registered archaeologist and these are the rules and this is the way how you do these things and now so so we have a sort of boom of 10 companies who will judge us archaeologists on, well, let's say, our professional accreditation. So we are now getting into a, uh, well, at the end of the year, you will be an accredited archaeologist or you will be not. Um, the system is still very much akin to what uh, CRFA is doing, but it is not in the hand of the archaeologist anymore. So by the back door, uh, we are regulated and someone is telling us what it is to be a professional. There are also a, a uh, set of rules. It's called the Quality Norm of Dutch Archaeology, the KNA. Nowadays it's up to version 3.2, so we have been busy in the last two years, and 4.0 is coming up. The big problem with the Quality Norm of, of Dutch Archaeology is that it is not about quality, as we archaeologists perceive it, it is about the process. And the second big problem is, it is a wonderful document, by the way, I praise it to bits, I will not say I love it, but it is a good description of what is ex expected of us. But does it ensure that we have good archaeology there? And most archaeologists in the Netherlands would argue that it is not. And then I come to the three big problems of how to organize, how to get people involved of being professional, how to be members of, for instance, NVVR or CRFA or even something less threatening as EA. And I I'm made very short shrift of it and, and very basic and, and almost existentialism uh, uh, 
things. First of all, the lack of enlightened self-interest among archaeologists. <laughs> um, what tell you? It's good to be have a self-interest. The big thing is that most of these conversations I have with, with fellow archaeologists say, I will join if. So if NVVR rules that that kind of archaeology is not happening, or if they make sure I get more paid more, or if they make sure there's less bureaucracy, or if, then I will join them. But then if we already have that, there's no need for you to join. The whole idea is, of course, that you sort of join up at the start and then collectively, by having the means, get to these points. But there is this idea, we are poor, so we cannot miss. I do believe NVVR, this state is, I do believe I paid 12 euros 50 for being a member of, of NVVR. Which is which is quite cheap, which is good. We like we Dutch like it, but then of course for twelve fifty you don't get very much. Um, yeah, <laughs> that's that's true in every economy. Um, second thing, the perceived amount of bureaucracy. Yes, we're Germanic. Yes, we are uh, very good in following the rules. We like the rules. We have a a big reference for the rules, but we also get sick and tired of it. And professional associations are being associated with more bureaucracy, more papers to fill in, more things to follow, a damming in of our freedom as archaeologists, a, a limiting factor. It's not a force for good. It's, it's caging us up even further than we are already caged in by, well, in, this, in our case, the state. And the last one, which is a really human thing, and it's the fear of being judged. You would say the fear. What's about the fear? Let me tell you a very short story. To get, I've been talking about becoming a member of CIFA in the Netherlands for the last 15 years or so. And I decided to do something new. We had a signing up party, which was just me in the living room with five other archaeologists. And we had cakes and drinks and we talked a lot and we laughed a lot, etc., etc. And I walked them to, to their cars after uh, four or five hours. And it's, I have to say it's quite a difficult thing, um, especially when people are not so sure about their English or so. And I came back after uh, being outside for a moment, and I was hit by a smell there. My house was smelling. Six archaeologists had been talking about becoming a member of CIA, and the house smelled like a tiger den. There was the stench of fear there. This is real. This is true. There's all this idea, now I'm offering myself up to someone else I don't know, and he is there and he will tell you if you're good enough. And that's something which, which is all in all of us. That who is the other, who is the other which tells me if I'm an ethical archaeologist? Who is the other who is allowed to judge me? And why should I open myself up to that judgment? And then I went back to 15 years ago, and I got very nice references to become a, uh, a MIFA from people in the room. Uh, they're the longest references probably uh, ever written for a uh, archaeologist who had done nothing in the UK. I do believe Kenny managed six pages and Pete managed eight pages. They're, they're wonderful. <laughs> I could have been eight archaeologists um, based on that. Um, so I was good. I was in, I was in the in crowd, etc. Et but then you get the message and said, could you provide? And there is this sort of primal fear there of, oh gosh, what are they asking them? They literally was asking me, could you sort of tell us what you have done and on the basis of the papers we cannot read? So <laughs> that was the thing, uh, nothing more than that. But that's, that's what fear does to us. And a lot of, in this climate, and a lot of this idea that archaeologists are marginalized or have a bad social economic position, that kind of emotion plays a large role of why people don't join up in this kind of organizations. Good enough, Pete. Good enough. Good enough. <laughs> Good enough. <laughs> oh, yeah. The, the, the problem is ventilation. <laughs> <laughs> well, you tend to forget it when you're busy. No? <laughs> uh, morning. I'm Peter Hinton, and I'm here representing the Chartered Institute for Archaeologists, about which most of you know quite a lot, so I won't dwell on it too long. Um, our definition of a professional, which I hope works for today, is someone who is skilled, someone who is committed to maintaining those skills, someone who has demonstrated their competence and skills to their peer group, someone who has signed up 
to a code of ethical behavior, ethical practice, and someone who is prepared to be accountable to that code. Um, so we look in terms of the skills, in terms of the competence, we're looking at technical competence and ethical competence. And like many professional associations, we look at technical competence ex ante, that is before people are admitted to the register, but we look at ethical competence ex post, that is when there is an allegation that someone has done something bad. The so we essentially we set standards for people uh, we set standards for organizations we set standards for the outcomes of archaeological work and we provide guidance on how to reach those outcomes with those kind of structures we have i can't remember the figures from yesterday's presentation but it's 2200 2300 registered archaeologists to use the American expression accredited archaeologists and we have about an, another 900 members of the Institute who are students who will potentially become accredited in due course or affiliates who are our <laughs> friends so about 3,300 uh, in all I think um, and we have some resources we have those we have those people who are committed to to the organization there is a lot of volunteer input but we also have enough resources to employ the equivalent of ten and a half full-time staff so everything's perfect and there aren't any problems um, no not really uh, many archaeologists the problem number one is that many archaeologists and many policy makers don't actually understand what professionalism is they don't value professionalism they think that it is self-interested they think that a professional association is there to promote the interests of the members of that association they don't understand that the association's goal is to set standards to ensure that the public and the client get good archaeology. The Professional Institute is there to protect people from bad archaeology. Um, so there is a lack of trust. <coughs> and so therefore, many archaeologists choose not to become accredited because they don't understand why. A second problem is that there are changes to the legislation in Sorry, in, in my problems, I'm, I'm talking about the problems that CIFA faces in the four countries that currently make up the United Kingdom. I'm not talking a, 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 about issues that the that, that, that CIFA professionals may face elsewhere because others are better placed to do that. But across the UK, there are economic and legal threats to the basis for a lot of archaeology, particularly commercial archaeology. Now, that might not necessarily be the business of a professional institute interested in self-regulation to worry about those kind of things, but we've chosen to be worried about that and we've chosen to become involved in it because we believe that you can't promote good archaeological practice if sites are being destroyed without investigation, if there isn't archaeology going on. So that's our second problem. And the third problem is a very mundane one, is we haven't got enough money and we haven't got enough resources to develop the Institute as fast as we would like and to do as much with our members, for our members and for society as we would wish to do. Now, we might sound pretty well off having 10 and a half staff. Give you a comparator, in the UK, the average professional institute has just under 100 employees. And those other institutes do exactly what we do. We're trying to do things with about a tenth of the resource that we need. We have some, you know, we probably don't need 100 staff because we haven't 
got enough archaeologists accredited. We could probably get by with 50, but that's, that's the scale of the, the, the problem. So we might, we might look well off compared to, 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 to some other organizations here, but actually we still haven't got the resources to do the job, and I suspect none of us have. Well, I'm Jaime Almanza, and kind of like Mark, I'm today representing myself because certain things happened the last couple of months, and now I'm former secretary of Colegio de Arqueólogos de Madrid. That is uh, one of the associations that, uh, professional associations uh, that we have in Spain. To understand this, uh, we need to understand how Spain works. Now, archaeology is regulated, so uh, is the state the one who tells you if you can work or you cannot work. So basically, we don't have any say on that. So people, when they join the association, they usually want the cheap insurance we provide. Anyway, uh, we have a structure that is quite different from, for example, CIFA, no? that you have four countries with one association. We have one country with 19 associations. Because <laughs> <laughs> although we only have 17 regional uh, governments, some of them have several. For example, Andalusia have four. So uh, they are distributed in provinces uh, mostly, but not one per province, because we have 51 provinces, but only like 19 associations anyway. The thing is that uh, we are quite uh, unstructured, and uh, we don't have the same problems in every state, because our first issue has to do with the standards. It's not the same working in Madrid than working in Andalusia or Cantabria and you get completely different, uh, let's say, rules you know, uh, to work on. Anyway, well, first of all, I would like to explain what we do, or what we say we do. Actually, we were doing it until we resigned. Uh, well, we provide cheap insurance, that is the main reason why people come. Uh, we are also the official representative body of, for archaeologists in the regional government. So every time there is a new law coming that affects heritage, we go there and consult. Uh, we don't do it before the law is uh, made. It should be like the optimal way. We just go there when they did it to tell them, no, you have to change this, 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 and this. And they tell us, oh, wow, but we cannot do it now because it's already in the assembly. So go, to, go talk with the political parties and maybe they do something. They never do anything. So anyway, but well, we are there. No, and every time they have to do uh, anything uh, that is kind of important, uh, like for example, now that we are registering all the civil war and post civil war heritage, uh, we are there. No, and we have our voice and we have the opportunity you now to to do something about it. Then what we actually do is events and training. No? Uh, we are doing approximately two courses per year that lately have been devoted to pottery. And I'm a bit upset about it because it's been like six years doing pottery. And we have a really good handbooks of pottery now edited that everybody wants and everybody buys. But it's just pottery. And I think that we need it quite other things to uh, refresh <laughs> on. Then events, and where we will have our annual conference. We have uh, like one, two events per month, one major event every three, four months. And basically, when we started doing our events, like the, the last board that resigned a couple of months ago, uh, what we wanted to do was building collective, because one of our main problems is that uh, we are not like, and, well, I think non-archaeologist is kind of a collective, <laughs> really, because you know? we hate each other. <laughs> so uh, basically, you, you cannot sit together with other colleagues. And we were trying to do events in which people could actually sit together, talk, uh, do different things, know each other, learn from each other. And we actually had a very nice one called Mitark that uh, it, wa it was supposed to be this Saturday, but as we resigned, they decided not to do it. And when I say they, we have the second, fuck, I, I have like five problems, sorry. <laughs> the second problem is that we are not like an independent professional association. We are a section in a bigger professional association in which uh, right now education has the leading uh, role, let's say. Uh, why? Because, uh, for example, in Madrid, there is around 10,000 people associated, but only 400 are archaeologists, and like 9,000 are 
uh, teachers and then maybe two, three hundred are other things like sociologists, um, historians, mathematicians, not things like that. So basically we don't have power within the, the bigger structure and this bigger structure is the one that actually joins together in nationally and the one that actually has the power to do real things. No? Uh, we had uh, two weeks ago a national meeting only for the sections of archaeology. And in this meeting, we could also identify another issue, and is that while there are certain sections that actually have the control of the whole structure, because they are more than the teachers, uh, they are working for different reasons than we are working. So, for example, for us, uh, the main role was actually like being a unite collective uh, working together for the best of us no, and trying to promote uh, better standards, a better code of ethics, uh, better regulations from the state and standardization of the protocols, etc. But they were just working for, let's say, themselves in terms of we have the control of the association so we can actually do whatever we want. But they are not doing like anything in terms of uh, archaeology as a profession. So anyway, that's another thing. Uh, so well, for us, basically, I said uh, already two problems, I think, no, that is the collective and not being an independent professional association. But uh, this leads us to another three ones. First of all, representation in terms of for the collective. I said that people is joining because of the insurance. When we organize an event, only like 20, 30 percent of the people attending are associates of, uh, of Colegio. All the others are people that are not in the association and they are not going to join because they don't need the insurance, basically. Uh, then we have an issue, and I think Mark said it, no, about uh, health, safety and labor conditions. No? Uh, we don't have any regulation on that. We are trying to do it, but we cannot do it because we don't have um, uh, like the, the power to do it. And they tell us, yeah, 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 we will join when you make uh, like uh, promoters to pay us better. Okay, if you don't join and we are not powerful, we cannot make promoters pay you better. So we are like in the same page there. And then the, the final and the biggest one that has to do with the standards and ethics. We have a code of ethics that probably 80% of the associates don't know. Actually, uh, I knew it like five years before it was official, <laughs> but suddenly they told us uh, the other day it was like 80 people in the room. Yeah, but we have a code of ethics and 60 of them were looking at each other like, oh, really? What is it? <laughs> 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 but anyway, we cannot make people uh, like... Uh, follow this code of ethics because as we are not the ones that tell you you can work or you cannot work and this has like basically all the uh, that, that is basically the point there not if i can tell you you cannot work because you didn't follow the rules then the state will say oh i don't care he can work he has the uh, he's a degree in archaeology so he can work no, no, but he was not doing his uh, work properly. And look, uh, according to our code of conduct, uh, he broke all these uh, articles. No, but I don't care. He's doing things well for us. No, and well for us means uh, he's giving them the reports on time, basically, and the materials to the museum. But also, well, the things of uh, the thing of standards that is uh, very related to ethics is that it's not only that uh, we don't have like clear, clear standards. It's also that they differ from person to person within the state. So if you are working in one region, you are getting certain lines to follow. If you are working in a different region, you are working totally different ones. Uh, all the materials you use, like the field sheets and all that, are different from region to region. So even uh, you have the situation that uh, in two slots that are together and you are sharing an archaeological site, this one has a different uh, system for registry than this one. So you cannot actually even compare the reports from both uh, professionals. No? Uh, and we actually have nothing to do with that, or we can do nothing about it, better because it's not in our hands and we don't have the power to try to change it as it's the state that is the one in control. And we have tried to talk to them, but the first problem that we are facing is that, that we are not a real association, that we are just a section within another association. And this section is not uh, representative enough to uh, push 
towards a better way of doing things. <coughs> so basically, that's it. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, my name is Stuart Elder. I'm the Vice Chair of the Institute of Archaeologists of Ireland. Um, Ireland is a bit of a unique situation in that we have two countries on the one island. We have the Republic of Ireland, which uh, British people tend to love and refer to as Southern Ireland, which is uh, an entirely incorrect name. <laughs> it was used for a few months uh, back in the 1930s, apparently. It <laughs> never, never became a, a, a proper term. But because uh, the six counties in the UK um, are called Northern Ireland, then by default, there must be a Southern Ireland as well. Now, there is a Southern Ireland. It's the southern half of the country, called Kerry, <laughs> things like that, and everything south of the Midlands. Um, so two, two, two jurisdictions bring two different sort of problems in that we have two sets of legislation to deal with. Um, the Republic of Ireland, the legislation is far stronger than that in uh, the North of Ireland, as we refer to it in the Republic. Um, <laughs> and I'm English, by the way. So. <laughs> I, 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 went to, I went to Ireland for six weeks' work in May 1997. Um, I kind of got stuck. Um, so the, the legislation in, in the Republic is, is far, uh, far tougher than it is in Northern Ireland. In the Republic of Ireland, every archaeological artifact belongs to the state. Um, in, in Northern Ireland, as in the, the rest of the UK, it's the landowner that has the entitlement to, to all the artifacts that are recovered. Uh, the Ulster Museum actually stopped accepting depositions of artifacts in the early 2000s, which, which created a big, big problem for companies working um, on both sides of the border. Because then what do you do with all these artifacts? You know, they're just sitting around in in your in your office. Uh, the museum don't want them because they don't have room for them. The landowner doesn't want them because it's just bits of pot and crap like that. You know, <laughs> play pipe and stuff. <laughs> what, the, what the hell? If I can't sell it, I don't want it. Um, so it, it's a case of well, do you do you chuck it and skip, or do you leave it on the shelf? And then if you leave it on the shelf. You've got problems where researchers trying to get access to, 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 to bits of pottery and, and things like that to compare comparison. At least in the Republic, we don't have that problem. Um, control of excavations in the Republic is through licensing. In fact, everything is controlled through licensing. We uh, and and in, in Northern Ireland, actually, um, you need to you need to take out an excavation license to um, to, to undertake. Um, excavation or testing. Um, now, in, in Northern Ireland, you only have to be, you only have to submit a CV and references um, in order to be proved sort of competent, uh, you know, to, to reach the certain standard, become a, a, a supervisor for a few years, um, be capable of, of conducting watching briefs and things like that. In, in the Republic, it's much different. You have to sit. Uh, in front of an interview panel. There is one person from the State Health Service, one person representative of um, an academic institution, and then one person from the National Museum of Ireland. You, you sit down, you're, you're grilled on your knowledge of legislation, you're grilled on your knowledge of archaeological practice, and you're grilled on your knowledge of artifacts, and um, particularly on um, because it, it's, it, it's kind of impossible to know everything about every artifact. Um, it's, it's important to know who to speak to, who the specialists are. If, you, if, you, if you're given a lot of metal, uh, on, on, because if you are given a tray of finds, uh, the sheet comes off, and it's like, okay, arrange, arrange all of these artifacts in date order. And it's like, <laughs> Hey, wonderful. You know, I've got, I've, got a, I've got a bit of bone, I've got um, some lump of metal, I've got some bits of flint, I've got some random bits of pottery, okay, the glazed pottery that goes down here. And you're shuffling things around and, you, and you're, trying to, you're trying to sort of describe everything um, as well at, at the same time to show that, you, that you're competent, you understand. Um, and then the, the museum person will say, okay, so 
you don't know what that lump of metal is, who would you talk to about that? So you say, right, okay, well, so and so and so and so, and if, if the answer is correct, then you get through. And uh, sometimes, like me, you have to do it three times. <laughs> um, so that's so that's a, so that's a bit of a challenge. So in, in, in terms in terms of regulation of professional archaeology, you have to have achieved a certain standard in order to take out uh, an excavation license. Only those who have passed the the, the the license competency interview can hold the license. That um, that eligibility is there in perpetuity. There, there was um, there was a sort of anecdotal suggestion that after ten years of not having taken out a license, um, your eligibility may have lapsed and you may have to resit uh, your driving test sort of thing. Um, I was approaching that because one of the one of the big problems that we that we faced in two thousand and eight when the economic crash happened. Um, 80% of the profession lost their jobs. And that's, there, there were around 1,200 people working in archaeology in, in, in public and private practice in academia in the three different sectors in 2007 when we did the Discovering the Archaeologists of Europe um, survey. Um, just over 1,200 people. And the following uh, five years, yeah. Um, uh, five years later, there were there were eighty percent less people employed uh, in archaeology. I was one of them. Um, so even even being even being a licensed archaeologist didn't guarantee that that uh, we carried on working. Now this this has brought problems because we were experiencing a bit of a brain drain. Now um, we we had we had the Celtic Tiger boom from the mid nineteen nineties. Until 2008, um, our, our our great friends in the European Commission gave us truckloads of money to build motorways and gas pipelines and things like that. Um, and, and I'm sure lots of uh, British taxpayers contributed to that as well. Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, and, it, and it meant that we we we've gone from we gone from a country of single lane main roads to all of a sudden having these shiny bit of motorways. And so. That, that's part of the reason why I'm, I'm still there 20 years later. Um, we we had we had this enormous uh, boom in archaeology, um, very very quickly ramped up from from a few hundred archaeologists up to up to 1,200 or more, um, all doing these massive linear infrastructure projects. Um, huge amount of expertise was was gained. It was very much a, a sort of production line. Archaeology, um, get in, dig it, get out, get on to the next one. Um, so publications suffered a little bit, but um, we've now had time to catch up on those. Mm -hmm. um, so the 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 IAI itself, um, the institute formed in two thousand and one. We formed out of the Irish Association of Professional Archaeologists, which was just a, a really loose collective of. Uh, of professional archaeologists. At the time, to be a professional archaeologist, or to be classified as a professional archaeologist, the only um, the only factor was that you had to be earning a living from archaeology. Therefore, you were a professional archaeologist. Um, there was no there was no sort of specific requirement to, to, to have a degree. Uh, now, in order to, to, to pass the license interview, the minimum requirement is a degree. So I was the first person in Ireland to actually achieve that without having to do that. I'm not, I'm not the only one, but I, I was the first. That's quite an achievement. Um, I have performed out of the Association of Young Irish Archaeologists, which um, is still going today, uh, mostly in the third level <coughs> uh, institutions. It's, a, it's an association of student and recent graduate um, archaeologists. And the Organization of Irish Archaeologists, which was chiefly the public sector archaeologists, um, because prior to prior to the late eighties, there really was no professional, uh, no private consultancies, no no commercial archaeology in Ireland. Um, <coughs> it started to creep in in the early nineties with 
private companies uh, or private individuals taking um, contracts that had normally been done by the Office of Public Works. Um, they didn't have sufficient archaeologists on staff to be able to do conservation works and excavation works in, in advance of conservation on some of the um, <coughs> historic sites. So they contracted for the work out. And that's really how commercial archaeology is set up. And then obviously with the, with the, with the road schemes coming, coming online from 1998 onwards, uh, we had a massive growth in commercial companies being set up. Uh, most of those are sadly um, gone now. Um, we're left with a few. A lot of a lot of small time uh, individual archaeologists left. Um, small companies that are starting up now. Um, the I we 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 have a mandate to represent the entire island of Ireland. So we overlap with with CIFA in terms of Northern Ireland. We we have members up there who are members of both CIFA and um, the IAI. Um, we have we have an ongoing three year plan. Um, current one runs until twenty eighteen, where we're looking at the at the problems that archaeologists face. We're looking at the problem that archaeology faces, uh, particularly as we're. We're now at the stage where we're coming out of a recessionary cycle and things are improving again. Archaeology work is coming back, which is great, um, because it means that those, those of us who can are slowly coming back into archaeology. I myself just rejoined the IEI and rejoined the board after, after a seven year absence, um, straight into vice chair. Interesting step, but there you go. Um, at least it was the chair. Um, we have, we have developed our own codes of conduct, which all of our members uh, adhere to. Um, we have a CPD program. It's not huge because we, we don't have the members. We're, we're currently running around about 350, which is pretty good because over, over all the years, even during the boom, even during the time we had 1,200 1, archaeologists working, we still had around about 350 members. A high proportion of lapsed members um, people who haven't paid membership for one year, two years. That, that was happening when I was treasurer back in 2005. So um, you know, it, it's an age-old problem, and, and it, it still will continue. Uh, we're representing on our cultural management committees. So the um, things like the Boyne Valley <coughs> Heritage Plan, uh, the uh, New Bench, uh, Area uh, Action Plan, the World Heritage Site, um, we have representatives on, on those sort of things. The Royal Irish Academy, we have representatives with, um, anytime the government sets up a, a task force for archaeology and heritage, we have representatives there. Um, we have one annual conference now. We've gone, we've, we've stepped back, we've stepped two. Uh, we're, we're down to having one. Um, but in, instead of the summer, Conference, we now have ArcheoFest, which is a, a weekend long, a, a long weekend uh, program of events in Dublin where we give people hands on experience of what it's like to be an archaeologist. There, there's, a, there's a big dig for kids where they can, it's basically a giant sandpit with uh, there's a cow skull and, and, and bits of fake uh, Viking artifacts, and the kids just play in the sand and dig stuff up. And like your test, like test in the museum. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. More or less, yeah. Um, and we, we also publish, uh, we try to publish annually the, the Journal of Irish Archaeology, which is a peer reviewed um, journal of, uh, of not, just, not just excavation results. Um, it, 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 it's a more, uh, there's a requirement for it to have more scientific elements. So it's, a, it's really a holistic sort of synthesis of all of the specialist input that, that went into to, uh, to an archaeological excavation. Um, the three key problems that we that we have always faced and that we continue to face. Um, one is the is the economic downturn. Uh, as I said, 80% of the practicing archaeologists lost their jobs in 2008. This has meant that we're we're suffering a brain drain. Um, we, we have road schemes that have been shelved, that are uh, 
funding is, is, is being released for, and we currently don't have enough archaeologists who have the experience of those large infrastructure projects, um, or, the, or the large <coughs> rural archaeological sites that go, go along with it. Um, because a lot of the work up to now in the past sort of four or five years has been very small bits and pieces, just a couple of people doing, doing a, a bit of an assessment. There's been no really big open area excavations. So coming back to, to, to excavating a medieval settlement or a, or a, a, a ring fort or a, you know, a Bronze Age ring barrow or something like that, um, we're, we're back to maybe a site director uh, with five or six years experience uh, who's never done something like that before and a bunch of students who are fresh graduates. Um, we, we, don't, we don't have a lot of middle ground. Um, the second big issue is that there, there, there are no clear structures to career progression. Um, it, it's, it's, it's not so much the problem of what constitutes a professional archaeologist. As I said, to be classified as a professional archaeologist, you just have to be an, uh, someone who is earning money from archaeology, whether that's whether, whether you've come through the university program or not, uh, is kind of by the by. Um, but um, promotion from sort of, so, so from sort of from trainee archaeologists, uh, we have a number of field schools now, which is which is good. Not all of the universities were running a, a fieldwork element. They they do now, which, which is a, which is a great improvement over ten years ago. Um, the uh, so you, you, you can go from trainee mm -hmm. and, and, and people people couldn't understand why they would come out of uh, they would come out of a degree course after four years in, in Ireland, uh, four years degree course not three. Um, why they would be at the bottom of the pay scale. Having a degree, and, and I would say, well, it's because you have no practical experience. You know, so you start the bottom uh, in the ditch. <laughs> Here's a map. Enjoy. Um, and uh, you know that that was that was a great cause of, uh, of, of derision, and and it, and it still kind of is. But I mean, if you're not going to teach a significant amount of fieldwork at the university, then you can't expect to come out and get a supervisor job straight away just because you have a degree. You know, everybody here has a degree, so. Like so, um, it doesn't really matter, you know. Um, but there's but there's no sort of structure. There's no like, okay, you have to serve an apprenticeship four years as as a trainee or, or as archaeologist before you become a site assistant, and then two years as a site assistant before you become a supervisor. You know, people were coming out and saying, well, I've got two years experience, I want to be a supervisor. No, you know. Um, and then maybe two years as a supervisor before you go and and see your license interview and become a, a site director. So that kind of that kind of lack of 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 a, of a career path. People were getting promoted into positions because they were family members, because they were friends, because um, you know so and so fancied so and so, so we made her a supervisor. That happened uh, a lot. Um, and I, I I always tried I always tried to promote people on on merit. Um, it didn't matter what their level of experience. Was if they were competent at doing something, I would ask them if they wanted to be supervisor, or they, or, or I would say, right, this person's good enough to be a site assistant. They, they can, they can work with mineral supervision. Um, but other, other people didn't, other people didn't do that. Um, the third problem we face is really a reluctance to engage with the IEI. Um, I think we've, we've pretty much heard that from everybody. From all the professional organisations, it's like, why, why would I join? Um, if you, if you don't, if you don't need the insurance, that, that's that's one that's one good way. If you're if you're if you're um, if you're able to give out uh, preferential rates on public liability insurance, commercial liability insurance, then obviously that's a good incentive to join. But if you're going to pay money and all you're going to get is a journal that you can buy for twenty euro a year anyway, um, that's a bit of a disincentive. You get 10 euro off the conference rate. That's really not a great incentive. You could put four letters after your name, MIAI, to show that you're a member. Big deal. 
it doesn't matter to your professional practice. If you're a member of the IEI or you're not a member of the IEI, you can still practice as a licensed archaeologist. So what's the point? And, and this, is kind of, this is kind of where we're going. You know, why should I pay you 100 euro a year membership when I'm not really getting much back? And this, this, is, this is what we've, we've always suffered from. Um, right back when, when, we, when we were IAPA, um, not all of the practicing archaeologists were members of IAPA. There was a bit of a, a concern among some that liked the loose association of professional archaeologists. They didn't want to go to the institute and say, right, you know, the institute is going to regulate us, it's going to make us adhere to professional codes and practice standards, all this sort of stuff. So they didn't join, and they still haven't joined, because they, they didn't feel that it was right for them. So trying to find, trying to find that balance, trying to, trying, to, trying to get the right fit, trying to do the right thing for the people that we claim to represent, because if we're saying that we represent the archaeologists of Ireland, and we're not representing at least 90% of the people who are working in professional practice, then we're not truly representative. Okay. All right. Well, thank you. So we can go to the next